December 2021. Just having a wander in the park. Thinking about whether I should be making a video about where we are in the pandemic and its effect on our lives, my life. It's tricky about where to start really. You should start I suppose with the uh, the virus itself which is mutating continually. I heard it reported some time ago that there were already 300,000 variations of the original virus actually known of by the scientists and then we just had one that is seemingly being identified by South African scientists that is now taking taking hold globally but the good news despite the government governments panicking about it the good news is that it's considered to be or have mild effect mild impact on whoever catches it <sighs> so the idea is if there was the Delta strain well there was a Delta strain that came around a few months ago and it quickly became the dominant strain um, pretty much around the globe I think and the idea is that as you go through various kind of waves of the virus ebbs and flows is that a particular variant will become dominant and squeeze out all the rest and recognizing that the variants really have only got I think about three percent of the DNA strand um, of these variants represents the variation of, on the original so 97 percent of the uh, the virus is the same as it was so if you catch it no matter what variant you catch you have the uh, the likelihood that you're going to develop some immunity against the whole strand of the uh, of the virus so anyway the good news is that this new mild version the omicron i think or moronic as some people are calling it um, is mild and there's a suggestion that that might become dominant and if that becomes dominant what you're effectively talking of is a virus that's going around the world that produces a bad cold and not the hospitalizations and the deaths in the elderly and obese so i guess that's good news I was just reflecting the other day on um, how much this has taken over my life, this this whole pandemic question. And I, I've estimated that I've either read, watched or heard well over a thousand different items of analyses, scientific papers, opinion pieces. So I'm pretty saturated right now and the whole process is about trying to triangulate what's going on within the various components of of, uh, of what represents the pandemic. And when you triangulate all these pieces of information, you come up with a pretty good, pretty reliable understanding about where we are at each stage as we as we go through the process. Now, you're never gonna be expert in anything because someone who's an expert epidemiologist is not gonna be competent to comment on the, uh, with authority on the politics or the economics. Um, but you have to try and make the best of what you can learn. Now, one of the things I have learned is that, generally speaking, people aren't paying attention. Um, I can't really blame them, the amount of effectively propaganda that's been thrown their way through the government's nudge unit that's the government's nudge unit in the UK and the the media the broadcast media in particular 
has maintained a level of fear and apprehension and anxiety that people will, I think people are just exhausted and they're just wishing for it to go away. You know, I had a friend of mine the other day just saying that he, you know, he's quite happy to take these uh, booster jabs for as long as it takes if it gets his life back. Um, I didn't ask him how many jabs he was prepared to take, how many boosters. Um, but presumably there would be some sort of a limit. Um, but who knows? People are so anxious and so exhausted that they will do whatever they're advised. If it brings with it the hope that this whole crisis will go away and we can get back to normal living. And then we have the jobs, the vax. I think at the beginning we could have been forgiven for expecting them to provide kind of an inoculation that the uh, typical vax provides. One shot, maybe a booster, and then you're good to go. And uh, because these were developed super quick, we proceeded under emergency use authorization only. And so consequently, we're not, no one is really 100% sure about the effectiveness of these jabs and the long-term, short, medium and long-term safety. So it's, it's, it's fraught with uncertainty. And if you're the sort of person who kind of follows instructions provided by the authorities, and you're constantly told that everything is safe and above board and, and is effective, then you will queue up and take your medicine. But if you scratch the surface and look at the emerging science around what's actually happening as a result of the jabs in terms of effectiveness, you see that from for the mRNA jabs as well as the AstraZeneca one um, there's evidence is now pretty pretty certain um, that the effectiveness of the jab um, soon after it's been taken as uh, you know you wait a couple of weeks before the effectiveness fully kicks in is that it, it go, it's 90% plus effective but now the signs emerging that after about two to three months it drops down to 30 odd percent effective with the presumption that uh, it's going to be even lower as time passes hence the discussion about boosters now if you're going to take a jab in order to maintain a, a given level of antibodies then you're going to be working on a timeline that's predicated on the effectiveness of the medicine that you've been taking so if the effectiveness wanes after say three months it's arguable that during the winter months when the prevalence of a, a virus of this nature is is around it's quite high then you'd want to be taking maybe a couple of jabs one before the winter and one before the winter is out uh, maybe not one in the summer so every six months seems to perhaps be a plausible prediction now, I'm not sure how, how how many of those people really want to take, because it's you know you know it's nobody really knows the long-term safety data. What we know about the short-term safety data is also emerging, and that here we've got um, the analysis that in the very short term, with the effectiveness being high, and the the kind of the level of adverse events. Uh, are not remarkable. In fact, you know, if someone takes the jab, the science is telling us that they are protected from death and hospitalization um, more than the unvaccinated. 
So that's undeniable at the at the beginning. But as time passes, you start to look at the various levels. I think there are five levels of adverse events in the VAERS and yellow card systems in the USA and the UK respectively. You find that the adverse events, which at level five means mortality, death, then your the the difference between the jabbed and the unjabbed is um, heavily weighted in the favour of the unjabbed. Crazy. So how do people make sense of all that? So as I say, the science is emerging and there's uh, peer-reviewed papers are being published almost on a, I'm sure on a weekly basis, but there's only a, a fraction of them get media attention, whether it's uh, mostly new media um, rather than the, the mainstream where this level of discussion is not very strong. You, uh, it's not very high. So you kind of do, you do wonder whether people are going to really get an idea as to whether it's going to be safe to take these jabs every six months with each time having the risk of an adverse event and an unknown cumulative impact over time. So many unanswered questions. So, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm just reporting on what I've read, seen, and listened to. Um, but when you consider the the risk of the of serious illness from the the disease itself, um, the risk of death is well less than one percent for most of the population, and about three to five percent for those over seventy. There's a risk calculation that needs to be done by anybody who's facing the decision on whether to take the medicine or not. And now politically, things are heating up. We've got from, we've moved from a position where people have been recommended to take the jab uh, once it's available, which was the beginning of this year. Uh, through the age groups, the eldest first, the most vulnerable first, before it goes all the way down. Now they're trying to jab children. Then it's moved from that to a position where now you've got in Austria and I think soon to be announced in Germany is that you're gonna we're gonna find a situation where these jabs are going to be mandatory um, they're trying to get a hundred percent of the population uh, jabbed it's almost like they don't want a control group in the ex in the in the big experiment about whether the, the new drugs are effective and safe. So we've, we've also seen in Australia the building of uh, what they call quarantine camps, which has echoes of concentration camps, where people who are suspected of having been exposed to the virus are so in the extreme they are actually being taken there by the authorities. Uh, ordinarily, I think people who are travelling uh, will go to these quarantine camps for a couple of couple of weeks, especially people who are kind of expats going back home or long-term visitors, so they can do that. But the idea that they're actually they're actually going around trying to uh, literally getting government officials or hired hands to literally transport people to these camps under threat of huge fines and so on. It's a bit scary. And I think where you've seen these mandates um, being implemented, like I said, in Austria, um, I believe what's happening is that there are going to be fines. So if you are offered the jab in 
January and you don't take it, you'll get fined 100 euros. If you don't show up in February, it's another 100. If you don't show up in March, it's maybe 200. And before you know it, you're racking up thousands of pounds worth of fines if you're a holdout. So they're really pushing hard. Never ever uh, heard, experienced or read any history which says for an illness of this nature that the government responses have been so draconian. It's, it's really incredible. So it makes you wonder where all this will end because there are going to be holdouts, people who for one reason or another maybe they've had the two jabs but they don't want to take any of the boosters until the safety record is uh, more assured. What are the authorities going to do with them? People who've kind of obediently followed guidance um, uh, presumably for their own benefit but they become pariahs because they won't continue with the program what are, what are people what are the authorities going to do then it doesn't bear thinking about so there are small in the UK I think there's about 5 or 6% of people who haven't complied with the guidance for whatever reason it's it's not for us to well I suppose people can speculate all they like but people have got reasons for for not doing it people who I think included in those are people who really are very avid in looking after their health lots of health food healthy food supplements every day lots of exercise there's some people who are just don't like taking pharmaceuticals I know people who don't even take a paracetamol get a cold they rest they drink loads of fluids and wait it out and they're suffering so I don't know what's going to happen to these people certainly when you look at the or hear about the majority of the population and how they're responding to the question of whether jobs should be mandatory there's a lot of support for punishing people who won't comply punishing and yet despite all that when have we had a situation where someone's been inoculated vaccinated against a disease so presumably they are at least to some degree protected and we know that now as I was saying before but they're worried about other people who haven't taken it why? because we do know if I didn't say earlier I'll say it again is that the jabs may protect but they do not stop transmission or catching of the virus so I know lots of people now who have been what they call double jabbed and they have succumbed to the virus and been poorly I think at least one of them has uh, ended up in hospital um, survived okay but so no great danger one would hope but there is uh, plenty of evidence around now and I think it's not just me I think everybody is beginning to realize that there are there are there's lots of this virus around and it doesn't really discriminate against whether you've been jabbed or not I would suggest some very big questions I'm not hearing a lot of them <laughs> from people yeah the South Af this South African variant so far as I suggested has been mild uh, produces mild illness no one's been hosp put in hospital or, or has died yet officially anywhere anywhere in the world yeah despite that the government in the UK has reintroduced the requirement for face coverings in shops and other large kind of large venues and there are restrictions on those who are doing international travel
uh, even if that's just to the to the continent uh, on on the train or something like that so we have and we have well what is it now it's about the fourth or something like that for the December I think there's some uncertainty around Christmas so people have been cancelling Christmas parties under the under the threat or at least the implied threat that uh, Christmas will be messed around with as it was last year so lots of people anxious about whether they're going to be able to get with family and friends and do what they would ordinarily like to do at Christmas time So should people be jabbed or not? Well, I haven't a clue. Everybody has to make their own decision. They've got their own health profile, their own uh, attitude towards risk. I think somebody who's elderly, seriously overweight, maybe has heart problems or is diabetic, then that seems to be a no-brainer queue up go take the medicine 17 year old teenagers who are fit much bigger question but it's not for me to say it's for everybody and their families to make their own decisions and those decisions should be respected um, people who are anti this jab or this series of jabs really should hold back on overly criticizing those who've taken it and vice versa live and let live and all that and given that we now know again through uh, official data that uh, there's about 96 percent of the uk population I think including children have detectable antibodies to this virus so that suggests significant protection from further infection and the consequences of infection so you've got what they call herd immunity with a few holdouts you would hope it would be over by now but it's not what happens next.